I was telling Sue uh, before service that I have a little extra fan up here on the podium uh, because uh, some of you who uh, attend Sunday school, you know that I've had kind of a random problem with like hot flashes over the last couple of years as though I'm like a menopausal woman or something. Um, so uh, so if, if I ever need to just turn it on, that's the reason why. And, um, and we will find out. But uh, anyway, anyway, that being said, enough about my um, weird uh, biological, I don't know, I don't know, enough, enough, uh, enough of that stuff. Um, we are continuing our series called Flying Right Side Up, um, which is about how real discipleship restores our humanity. And our, uh, our text today is Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24. So if you're using a pew Bible, one of those little tiny Bibles there that has even little tinier print, uh, that'll be on page 618. And uh, you will also find, if you look in the bulletin, that I'm using an outline, uh, or I'm giving you an outline, rather, to follow along, which is a little different uh, than what we usually do, but I just felt like I'm, I'm trying to kind of do enough new, trying to give, I'm giving you a lot of things today, and so I wanted you to be able to, to follow along there. And uh, it's interactive, kind of. You fill in, you know, fill in the blanks and things like that. So, uh, so we're going to be doing that. Uh, but we're continuing this series on our growth in grace to turn our attention today to the primary thing uh, that changes uh, when we come to Christ, when we become a Christian, or when we go from sort of being a cultural Christian to, I would say, a real one. And um, sometimes, sometimes that's what happens to us. When we live in a place where Christianity has been so culturally entrenched that um, that's a good thing, because that means that the gospel has had that much of an influence over, over a society. But what happens is that you can embrace something just because it was maybe a norm or something like that, and it's not really real to you. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is that which shifts in our hearts when it becomes real to us, and we'll be talking about that, and there's a shift that takes place. So I'm going to look at uh, Ephesians 4, verses 17 uh, to 24. Here's the word of the Lord. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart or a hardness, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, or after the likeness of God in some translations, in true righteousness and holiness. It's the word of the Lord for us today, and we're glad. Now, there's a lot that can be said here. This is one of the more rich texts in the entirety of the New Testament, I think. Um, I could spend a week on almost every single clause in each sentence. Uh, in uh, this passage that we just read. And some, pe some preachers would, some preachers have, but I want to try to keep things uh, as simple as we can. Paul is presenting two ways to live, and only two. He's, he's presenting two ways to live, just like Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember the narrow path that leads to death, and, or I'm sorry, the, the broad path that leads to death, and the narrow path that leads to life. Paul is explaining what these two paths are and what these two ways of living are, and they lead to two different places. Unlike if you were to go this afternoon, take just a stroll over to New York City or something like that, uh, which is you know not, not a stress-free thing to do. If you were to pull out your map app on your phone and put that you want to go to the city, it would pull up probably like two or three different ways to get there, right? And if you were to take some turns and change things, um, it would course correct with you because there are a million ways to get to the same place, aren't there? But there's only two ways of truly living and they don't go to the same place. 
They go to different locations. This is very, very simple. Jesus made it this way, and Paul is doing the same thing. So only two ways of living, and we're getting into our uh, outline there if you want to follow along. The first way is a way that, is in, that includes futility of mind, verse 17, futility of mind, alienated from God's life and prone to corruption through deceitful desires. That's on your outline there. Futility of mind, verse 17, alienation from God's life, verse 18, prone to corruption through deceitful desires. That's verse 22. The word for futility, uh, futility is used three times in the New Testament, only three times. Uh, once for the creation, in Romans 8, it talks about how the creation post-fall is subjected to futility. Once for the vain words of the ungodly, 2 Peter 2, and then here, for the mind that is not set on God. What is it? It's futile. It's a mind that is subject to futility. It's a word that means vanity or emptiness, purposelessness, or even instability. That's what futility is. The mind that is alienated from God is vain, purposeless, and unstable. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a purpose. It's living for things. It's just that it's not a real purpose that lasts for forever. And I think that this is what we see in the fact of cultural changes to moral and ethical norms. A lot of you have lived through the two kind of major cultural transformations that have happened once in the 60s and then once in the last probably 10 years. And you know that what happened was a change in what was accepted as, as a normative ethically and morally and all of that. Um, those changes occur in a society not because a society loved the Lord um, and then they stopped loving him, but because cultural norms were based on what was in vogue and what was popular. That's what we mean when we say it's unstable. The mind is futile if it's not set on God. It's unstable and therefore it can be lost. Furthermore, it's alienated from the life of God, alienated from God's life. Quite a phrase there, isn't it? He is himself life. He's our ever-flowing fountain of life. We talked about that a few weeks ago. This means that we are constantly, constantly dependent on him for life and breath and everything. We can't get away from the Lord. Even to just wake up in the morning is to wake up in God's world and God's presence, isn't it? There is therefore no ground, even if you take, if you ascribe to the biblical doctrine that some people are God's people and some people are not. It's called the doctrine of election. I believe it. Um, I understand it raises some questions and things like that, but even if you take that and believe it, there is no ground to argue that in some sense God doesn't love everybody because he does. If he, if he didn't, he wouldn't not only create people, but then also continue to provide for them and care for them. That's why Jesus can say in the Sermon on, Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies Pray for those who persecute you so that you can be like your, what? Father, who, who gives and gives and gives to people all the time. You'll be like your father if you love your enemies. Why? Because that's what he does. He is constantly taking care of people. And salvation is what happens when you come to see, and I'm, this is a strong way to put it, when you come to see that he is the only one who's actually living. And when I say living, I mean the only one who has life in himself. Everything else, including all people, are dependent upon him. He's the only one living. Athanasius in the ancient church put it like this. And by the way, that's a great name, isn't it? Athanasius. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, like, why, is, why hasn't that name come back uh, in uh, naming kids? But put it like this. Only God exists. And no, we're not going to... If, if the Lord were to ever give us more children, I don't think I'm going to try. I don't think I'm going to try to convince Kate of Athanasius. But uh, um, Athanasius put it like this: Only God exists, and us coming from Him. He's the only one who truly is living, and then we depend upon Him for our life. You kind of understand what I'm saying here. It's it kind of sounds a little galaxy brain, but it's it's true based on a biblical understanding of reality. He is the one who is life-giving and we depend on him. So I become the real me when I come to him and acknowledge the life of God and I, and I look to him. Until then, I'm alienated 
from the life of God. And I'm living a, I'm living a fantasy, a dream world where I don't really need God and where I don't have to acknowledge that I depend upon him. So futility of mind, alienated from the life of God. And then thirdly here, prone to corruption through deceitful desires. We talked about this last week today. Love is reduced merely to feelings and desires, such that if I feel something, it must be a reflection of something that is real. So what's the phrase that people use all the time? Love is love, right? But what that means is lust is love. If I feel a certain way, if I desire a certain way, therefore it must be real, it must be legitimate. Paul is here saying the same thing Jesus said in the Gospels, the same thing that the writer of Hebrews says, the same thing the prophet Jeremiah said, desires can deceive. Just because you feel something, that doesn't mean that it's true, that doesn't mean that it's real, and that doesn't mean that it's good for you. Love isn't love. Love is what God says love is. And he would know because he is love, right? Being Trinity. The passions of the flesh wage war against your soul, Peter says in 1 Peter 2. And so what this means is, is that if I'm subject to deceitful desires, I am prone to give in to them, and they will cause me to spiral and lose myself and lose my identity. I'm alienated from God's life. My mind is purposeless compared to its true purpose, and I'm a slave of my desires, whatever those desires are quite a way to live, and yet the multitudes would go this way, and so would we, if not for the grace of God moving in our lives and drawing us to himself. Therefore, the second way of living uh, on the outline there is renewal of the mind, verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, illuminated by truth that is in Jesus, who is the life of God, as it's spoken of earlier, and becoming like God in true righteousness and holiness. Note where it all starts. It starts in the mind, doesn't it? We hear of the truth, we process it mentally, and when somebody's come into Christ, it grips them. It takes a hold of them, and it grips them, and it changes their life. But here Paul is saying, this doesn't stop. Keep giving yourself to the renewal of your mind. Keep changing. Keep letting the Lord shape you and mold you. This is not something that we ever turn off. We never turn our brain off as a Christian. We never get to the place where we know everything. If you think that you do, you don't know anything, actually, is what the apostle says. And I've been thinking about this recently um, as I'm getting, I'm getting kind of getting right to the end of my, uh, of my doctoral work, um, finishing this up, and I'm, I'm about to finish my, my dissertation, turn it in and all that. One of these days, we will have a, just a night as a church where we get together, and I just read to you the whole project. I'm just kidding. We're not really going to do that. But we will get together, and we'll talk about what I've been working on writing for forever. Um, it intersects with things that we, uh, that we talk about at church, things I preach about. So you've heard a lot of what, I, what I'm writing about. But um, you get to the end of the program, and you think that when you get to the end of it, well, you're just going to know everything. And what happens is, it's kind of a cliche, people say this, but what happens is you get to the end and you actually, feel like you, you actually feel like you know less than you did when you started. But it's actually not that you know less. All it is is that you realize how much more there is to know, right? Your world of, of knowledge was like this, and it's like, oh, I'm going to become an expert in that. But then after studying for all this time, you realize, no, no, no. It's like this. It's bigger. There's so much more than I thought that there, that there was. And I think this is similar to what happens as a Christians. We, he keeps showing us how deep Christ is, how deep the Lord is himself, and furthermore, also how deep sin goes within us. And so we're constantly on this journey. We're constantly growing in our understanding and in our knowledge. We never, we never arrive. I think we were talking about this Sunday night. John Bunyan, the great writer of a Pilgrim's Progress, talked about how there's a difference between getting worse and worse and getting clearer and clearer about how bad you are. Those are two different things, right? And as we journey, that's one of the things that we realize. It's just how deep sin goes into me. 
but how deep the wells of grace are in the Lord as well. Because it's never, my sinfulness is never too much for him. Whereas sin abounds, grace what? Abounds all the more. And so we have to constantly, constantly be growing, being renewed in our minds. Illuminated, uh, furthermore, there by truth that is in Jesus. He is himself the life of God. First John 1 talks about this. Truth incarnate. You remember the um, great verse there in John's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. To say that he is the life is to say that he is our source of being. To say that he is the truth is to say that he is our foundational absolute that we build our lives on. And to say that he is the way is to say that he is our path of living as well. He's our source, he's, he's our truth, and he is our path that we are following. Christ is our very life. And furthermore, created um, after or according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And there in verse 24, this is Paul reminding us what we need to remember and what we need to always be reminded of, and that is that we are a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. That is to say, not that the old creation isn't present, it's just that it's not who we really are. It's present as a, as a, um, so a privation, I could say, of, um, of our true self. But our true self, who we really are, is Christ living in us um, and transforming us and making us new. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We've unhitched from Adam, we've rehitched to Jesus. Adam squandered the life that he had, passed it down to us, so we squander it. Jesus is God made flesh who established righteousness by his perfect life, and then he passes it down to us. Now I have a different family tree. And some of you have, um, some of you have done like, uh, like ancestry studies, and you've, you've maybe done family trees before. And sometimes in that kind of study, you realize things about your, uh, your family's history that aren't really, aren't really proud. You know, they don't really make you very proud. Um, and if you look at your family tree, it's like, boy, I just wish that that branch would have gone that direction instead of that direction. If it just would have gone there, I'd feel a little bit better about my, my heritage and my history and all those kind of things. This is truly what happens when we come to Christ. We're diverted away from Adam and the fall that came in him to a different tree where Christ, the true vine, supplies us with his eternal life. Now, whereas before, I was prone to corruption, right? I was prone to corruption through deceitful desires. Now, I'm prone to godliness and Christ-likeness. I can go back to the old self sometimes, but it's like my magnetic force has been changed. I'm not, I'm not near as pulled to those things as I used to be. Now I'm being pulled towards the Lord, and he really is changing me. I have changed, and I can change. That's what it means to be a new creation. By the way, the word for holiness there in verse 24 in the Greek is not the same word as, uh, as hagios, uh, which is usually translated as holiness in the New Testament. It's a different word, and it's, it's kind of a peculiar word, but it's a word that means proper, um, appropriate, or um, one definition I saw online was that it's, it's a sanctioned purpose by God, something that God sanctions. So the idea here with holiness is correct, or to be in sync with God, to be like him, to be doing things that he, that he does, living in some sense like he does. And notice what he says there in verse 22, you put off concerning your former manner of conduct, the old man. In verse 24, you put on the new man, created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We put it on like clothes. We take off the old, we put on the new. It is an appeal to the will. This is something that we choose to do as Christians. We don't sit and think about it and wait until we'll really mean it to do it. We do it because he tells us to. Don't be your old self. Be your new self. You were created to be a new self. Don't be stupid. Don't live in the futility of your mind. Be the new self. Now, practically speaking, moving on in the outline here, practically speaking, 
The first way um, is distinguished from the second way this way. The first way hides from God by, uh, by making excuses. So that's your, that's your next outline there, or underline, I should say. It hides from God by making excuses. It lives for material things, um, and it needs affirmation from others and from, our, and from ourselves. So you remember Adam? Because he was ashamed, he hides behind the bushes. And then when uh, God comes and calls him out, he makes excuses. It wasn't my fault, God. It was your fault and it was her fault. Nothing's my fault. This is what everybody does now. They hide and then they make excuses. And they live for material things. They're entirely materialists. They're living in a material world. And now I'm not going to finish the quote from the Madonna song from the 80s. I have to say, I I have to confess this to you. Um, Not that I'm a Madonna fan, I'm not. You thought I was going to go there. Um, But I was telling uh, Jeff and Phil at an elders meeting uh, the other uh, other night, I am naturally a materialist. I find myself constantly stimulated and enjoying things that I can sense, right? That I can see, that I can hear, that I can touch, that I can taste, that I can smell— all those kinds of things, and I've realized how much of a challenge that is to my call to find my satisfaction in Christ, who I can't see, touch, feel necessarily. That's something that it has to be overcome, doesn't it? But this is what happens when we live the first way. We're living for material things, and furthermore, we need affirmations from others and ourselves, and therefore we cannot believe in him. And I say this purposely because this is what Jesus says in John 5, 44 to a bunch of people who aren't believing in him. He says, he says, you can't believe in me because you receive glory from one another. He doesn't say you don't or you won't. He says you can't believe in me because you just want respect. You're Rodney Dangerfield. You just want respect. And uh, that's what you're living for. And you're demanding it. And so therefore your praise is not from God, but it's from man, right? Constantly needing affirmation. This is, by the way, how idolatry happens. We make much or too much of created things. It's not bad to be affirmed. It's bad to live for it. It's not bad to use material things. It's bad to glorify and worship them outside of their proper usage. And it's not bad to feel ashamed in the presence of God's holiness if we have something to feel ashamed about. It's bad just to run from him and not run to him. And this way of living leads us to grow corrupt again, as it says in verse 22. I'm reminded of Psalm 115 when it says that people lift up their hearts to idols, false gods that don't have ears, don't have eyes, don't have noses, and those who worship them become what? Like them. You lose yourself. You don't realize what's happening to you. You lose yourself inwardly. Sometimes you lose yourself outwardly, and it's a devastating just crash that everybody sees. But sometimes everything looks great on the outside, but there's no life on the inside. And this has always been the case. There's always been even religious people. And Jesus talked about this all the time, as did the Old Testament prophets. There's always been religious people who look great and godly on the outside, but inside they're dead. That's the practical way that the first way of living manifests. The second way, the way that Paul says we should be living, the narrow path, instead of hiding from God, that next underline acknowledges God's supremacy, that he alone deserves the throne. That wasn't meant to rhyme, but it did. It recognizes, it acknowledges God's supremacy and his goodness as loving trinity. And it uses material things for his glory and our enjoyment as a gift received in thanksgiving. You remember Peter in 1 Peter 2 uh, saying, if indeed you have tasted, we just read it in Psalm 34, if you've tasted that the Lord is what? Good. Is he good to you? Do you find God enjoyable, delightful? 
Is God fun to be around? Be honest with yourself. He is indeed good, loving Trinity. I don't have to hide from him. I acknowledge his supremacy and his goodness. And I use material things for his glory. That's what it means to grow in grace and to be mature is to is to understand that things have a proper usage in God's economy. So the things that I used to make much of and things that I used to use as an end to themselves, I don't use as an end to themselves anymore. At least I shouldn't be. Whether it's money, security, food, people can live for that. Music, sports, sex, we could go on and on and on things that God has created for a proper usage that we then use for our own purposes as an ends. God calls us to use them as a means to the end of glorifying him and enjoying his creation within the proper context. And furthermore, furthermore, not only using material things to glorify him, but instead of needing affirmation from other people, I only use, aff- when I say I, I'm not meaning that this is me doing this perfectly. What I mean is that, is that potentially, if things are going well, this is how I should be living. I only use affirmation from others as a means of ministry. This is, why, this is what Paul talks about in his letters all the time. He says, we don't want to put a stumbling block in anyone's way. I want to do everything I can to please everybody. Why? So that they'll come to Christ so that I can be at peace with people, not so that they'll love me, but so that they'll love him, and I won't be in the way. So ultimately, here's the difference between these two ways of living. Um, This is the shift that I was talking about in the introduction. The difference is the place of God in our priorities. The place of God in our priorities. Um, I go from, I would say, perhaps using God for my purposes, there's a shift where I learn, I've realized God has created me to use me for his purposes. And actually, that sounds pretty good. And when a person truly comes to Christ, when they truly have been converted, um, when they've embraced him, that becomes the attitude. Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go used to be living for this world, and God matters insofar as he helps me to do so. But now I'm living for God, and the world matters insofar as it helps me to do so. You see the difference? Two just diametrically opposed approaches to life, isn't it? Living for God, and the world is to glorify him, or living for the world, and God is supposed to be glorifying it. So I say all this, and you probably are amening everything that I've everything that I've said so far, um, and uh, you're probably you probably would affirm most of it. But the question is, why do I still feel the pull to go back to the old way? Why is it that I still find myself, after perhaps all these years of walking with the Lord, growing in grace, um, maturing, and all those kind of things, why do I still feel the pull? to go back to the old self. Um, And this is what I want to spend the remainder of our time on this morning, and I'm hoping that I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but you'll look on your outline there. You have the nature of self uh, there on the bottom half of the page. And I meant to get to this last week, but I ran out of time. This is a little bit complicated, um, but it's the reason why there's an insert today, uh, is because I just think that If I were to just be talking about this, it'd be really hard to follow, so I wanted to give you something that you could put your eyes on while I'm talking about it. I want us to try to understand as we prepare ourselves for the rest of this series, the nature, ourselves and our human nature. And I think that understanding this will help us to understand why it's such a struggle to grow and therefore why it is that we can begin or how it is that we can begin to grow. And I'm really Uh, I've really gotten a lot of this type of stuff from, uh, I've mentioned Dallas Willard's name. He was a a Baptist pastor who was also a philosopher out on the West Coast for many years. He's uh, with the Lord now, but I just recently found this to be so illuminating and enlightening, and I hope that it is for you as well. So the first thing I want you to see, 
The nature of self, as regards our nature, is that we are body and soul. Okay, so we are body and soul. There is body, physical. There is soul, non-physical, right? And that shouldn't be too hard for us to get our heads around. I think we all pretty well know this, that we are a duality with a material side and an immaterial side. There's a part of us that can be seen. There's a part of us that can't be seen, just like there's a part of the rest of creation that can be seen. But there are also things that are uncreate that are part of creation that can't be seen. I was talking to eighth graders about this this past week. Can you see God? No. That doesn't mean he doesn't exist, right? Can you see right or wrong? No, you can only see it being practiced. But the standard, you get the point. There are things that can be seen and things that can't be seen that exist in the same way that it is for human nature. But as regards our dimensions, again, following along on the outline there, there's more than just body and soul, but there's mind and heart as well. Now, again, I'm saying that we are body and soul in our nature. I'm just saying that if you further break it down, there's more to us than just body and soul. There's mind and heart too. And, the re and they're all in relationship with God somehow. Somehow or another, your body relates to him, your soul, your mind, and your heart. Here's the reason why, I've, why I think that it's okay to distinguish these four from each other. Um, because the Bible does. You remember the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with what? Your heart, soul, and your might. In Deuteronomy, when Jesus quotes it, I heard some of you saying it just then, when Jesus quotes it in the Gospel of Matthew, he not only continues distinguishing between the heart and the soul, but then he adds the mind as well. The heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the reason why they're distinguished is not because I want to make things complicated for you, but it's because they all deal with different things in our lives, don't they? The heart is the will or the spirit. It chooses what we think about, what we do, what we say. That's the heart. That's why it drives the life. And Proverbs says you have to guard your heart because it drives the life. You are choosing all the time what to think about, what to say, what to do. You've got to guard, guard, guard that. There's also the mind that functions via thoughts and feelings. I've got a whole message ready in a couple of weeks that's going to be talking about feelings because I think that's a big part of things. Those happen because of the mind. And then the soul, and maybe I'll, when I kind of compress all this series into a little booklet to give to you, think of the soul as kind of like a, a dimension that kind, of, that kind of touches everything else in us. It's kind of a meta dimension. It's bigger, it's kind of bigger than everything else. It touches everything. It's the deepest part of us, but it is a little bit distinct from, from the heart, from the mind, but they're all related. And here's why it matters. Here, here's why it matters. Again, looking at the outline there, pre-regeneration, what you have there is the list of priorities. How the unregenerate mind or the unregenerate life in general prioritizes the various dimensions of our lives. You have first, body. That's the most important thing to the mind that is set on the flesh, as Paul says in Romans 8. That's why society today is body-obsessed, entirely body-obsessed. It used to be about looking great. Now we are praising people who don't look great, but you see what's in, what it has in common? It's all about how people look. Body obsessed, constantly body obsessed. That's the first thing. What my body tells me, that's the most important thing about me. Then my soul, which is my sense of self based on what I look at, what I see about myself. And then my mind after that, the thoughts and the feelings. I will think based on what my body and my soul tell me. And then and only then am I ready to make decisions. That's why will or heart comes number four. Uh, they're under the pre-regenerate mind. My will moves after my body does, and my soul does, and my mind does. And God can only be a part of my life insofar as he helps me do what I want. That's why he's at the bottom. So 
My body, my soul, my thoughts and feelings drive what I do. And God can be a part of things insofar as he helps me do what I want. You see how this is the unregenerate mind. It's the mind set on the flesh, as Paul says in Romans 8. When I come to Christ, when God gets a hold of a person, you will notice the, that this whole way of prioritizing exactly flips. So that now God is number one. He's Lord. He tells me what to do. But probably the most surprising part of all of this is that the will or the heart then is prioritized even before the mind. And what this means is that there are going to be times when I have to do things that I don't understand. I have to pray for my enemies. I have to turn the other cheek to people and let them slap it. That doesn't make sense to me, so I'm not going to do it. And Jesus says, it doesn't matter if it makes sense to you. You've got to do what I say, or else you can't be a Christian. A Christian says that, Je- that what Jesus says goes. So the will is up under God, then the mind with the thoughts and the feelings, as a will or heart is connected to the Lord, the mind then can be filled with what the Lord wants to give it because the will is submitted to him. Then the soul, and then and only then the body. You see, it's not unimportant. It's just that it's the least important part of me. That's why Paul can say, present your bodies to God as those who have been brought from death to life, Romans 6. That's also why he says, I beat my body and make it a slave when he's talking about uh, his ministry and how he, he um, endures afflictions and sufferings and beatings and things like that. And it seems like the implication is I don't want to do these things. My body's so tired as an old man who's been ministering now for forever. He says, doesn't matter. I tell my body who's boss, the Lord. Doesn't matter what my body says. And the reason why I'm going through this is not to make a bunch of little philosophers uh, or, anthrop- or anthropologists here in church. But the reason we go through all this is because both of these approaches to life are inside of you. Both of them are inside of you. Uh, Last week after uh, after church, um, I was uh, in a conversation with Sue who told me that the, uh, the what is it, the shingles virus is inside of me because I had chicken pox when I was a kid. That was not a diagnosis that I was expecting to get after church last week. I'm just kidding. But I'm just kidding about how it didn't like affect me, but... That was something that I didn't know about something that's inside of me. And a lot of times we forget that that flesh, mindset on the flesh that puts the body first and God last, that's inside of us too. Even though there's a new self that's in you as well that puts God first and the body last and everything else is properly prioritized. And so the context of discipleship, the reason for all of this, here is what the context of discipleship is. Here, here is what you bring to the church. Here's what you bring to the Lord as you're following him. Here's what you bring to church as you're in Bible studies. Here's what you bring into your witness with you when you go out into the world and you try to do the best that you can to witness to people and be a good witness. What you bring to it is entanglement between priority lists. You have entanglement between the type of life that subjects God to self and the type of life that subjects self to God. And you know this about yourself, don't you? You feel yourself constantly wanting to serve self and not God, but you also know, I need to serve God, not self. And there's just this tension, this fight that's going on, this entanglement The goal of discipleship, now that we're at the bottom of the outline there, is overcoming this entanglement. And it's not something that's going to happen today, tomorrow, the next day, or the next day probably. But it's something that's going to happen as the Lord wills, as we continue to just follow him as our shepherd, patiently by the renewal of our minds, tapping into the life of God, 
growing in true righteousness and holiness, making mistakes, failing him, failing others, and then throwing myself back on the Lord's grace and saying, please remember, Lord, I still have the flesh in me. That doesn't mean that I live a defeatist life where I don't think that real change is possible. This isn't what B.B. Warfield called um, miserable sinner Christianity. But neither is it Christian perfectionism, right? I don't think that I'm going to be practically perfect in this life. Probably not. But Lord, you see what a mess you have when you look at me. (laughs) Untangle me. And the the freedom, there's supposed to be a, a palpable, discernible freedom that comes when God is first. When I say the whole of myself is subject to him, he does with me what he wants, and I trust him. It was said, some of you know the name, uh, George Mueller, I think. Uh, he was an um, uh, open to orphanage in London. He was a friend of Spurgeon uh, back in the 19th century. And, um, and if you look up pictures of this man, he just had such like a sweet smile about him. Um, it was said about him that he was a man who wore Psalm 23 on his face. Not literally, he didn't have a tattoo on his forehead or something like that. Um, but I read that this past week and I just thought, boy, Lord, I want that to be said about me too. That I truly know that he's my shepherd, that I shall not want, that he leads me for his name's sake, he gives me rest, his, his rod will discipline me, his staff will fight off the enemy so that it comforts me that he is never going to let the enemy destroy me and he's never going to let my flesh destroy me either. Goodness and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life. I'll dwell in God's house forever. You only get that if God goes to the top of the list. And that's what Jesus came into the world to bring, was a people who would be restored from the inside out, from the ruin that we inherited in Adam. And if we'll simply follow him, wait on him, trust in him, he promises that he'll get us there. That's probably enough out of me. Let's pray. So, Lord, today, um, thank you just for the reminder that um, whereas we are tangled up um, webs of of, um, mixed priorities, you didn't uh, come to save a well people, but you came to save sick people. So minister to us, O Lord, we pray. And I pray that if there's anybody here who has not bowed the knee to Christ, who's not run to him, who will receive them, let them not harden their hearts and come to you. And for us who are believers, may we not harden our hearts either, but soften them and keep them open to the Lord subjecting ourselves to him, that is true, true freedom. And for freedom, Christ set us free. And we rejoice, O Lord, as we're going to sing in the coming minutes, that all we have is Christ. He is our very life. And he is all we need. And so we pray all this in his name. Amen.